It is very important that we keep ourselves spiritually connected with Allah through our ibadat, our prayer, our siyam, our recitation of the Quran. But we have something greater to do, and that is be a khalifa. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then teaches Prophet Dawood in another ayah. He says, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. O Dawood, we made you responsible on this earth, right? But how are you going to be responsible? What is Allah teaching Dawood as and teaching us? Fahkum bayna nasi bil haqq. And so make sure that you judge between people with the truth. We're going to talk about this truth in a minute. And do not follow your own desires. So as a leader on this earth, as a caretaker of this of humanity and everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, what is your responsibility to judge, to reform, to help those around us by not following your own desires or what you think is right or what you think is good or what you think is bad. The haqq is what we follow. And what is the haqq? What is the truth? That is Allah's way. And that's part of this Western sh paradigm shift that we're having a problem with as Muslims. We don't realize that the truth of Allah subhanahu wa or forget sometimes actually, the one that defines right and wrong, the one that defines good and bad, the one that defines acceptable and unacceptable, Oh, the one that defines who we ally with and who we don't ally with is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the definer and of the haqq, the truth. So as caretakers of this earth, as khalifa on the earth, you are responsible for making sure that how you play that role is aligned with Allah's definition of right and wrong. Allah's definition of what should be the way things are done on this earth. Right? And that is the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, He made us make sure that we know that we are, khalaf, uh, we are khalifa on earth, that there are parameters of how we follow this role, and that is the parameters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He defines the haqq, and that we have the ability, right? We have the knowledge and the ability to learn and the ability to grow and the ability to understand so that we have the skills needed to do this. So my question now for all of you is, First of all, we have to make sure that we understand the haqq, the parameters, and that everything that we do on this earth, the purpose that we have on this earth, we make sure it is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's what Allah wants us to do. And then we have to ask ourselves, I mentioned this in my session yesterday, what is the skill? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam to learn things. He taught us to learn. He gave us abilities. What is your ability? What is your skill? How are you going to use that amana, that trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that uh, to make sure that you are walking a khalifa on earth, right? Are you a writer, right? Are you a scientist? Are you somebody who's interested in taking care of the environment? Are you an advocate for social justice? What is your ability, your skill, your strength that you're going to develop and grow because you're going to use it in the haqq in Allah's way to be the khalifa. So that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you one more, one time, you can say to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, I did my best, I understood my role, I learned, I used my ability that you gave me and I tried my best to stay within the haqq so that you can be pleased with me as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now subhanAllah, we're going to talk a little bit about, so what exactly am I going to do as a Khalifa? Now I kind of know my parameters, I understand my deen, I know and I've kind of thought about and researched and developed the skills that I have. What kind of work can I actually do? Two things I'm going to talk to you about, two very important things, definitions. Number one, da'wah. Number two is islah. Find your path in da'wah or islah. What are those two? Da'wah and both of these actually together are the way of the prophets. The prophetic methodology, every single prophet worked in da'wah and islah simultaneously. Sometimes in their life they'd focus more, right? Like in, 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 in Mecca there was more focus on da'wah and Medina maybe more focus on islah. But every prophet worked both paths, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our prophet Musa alayhi salam teaches us about da'wah. He teaches us the importance of da'wah. He says, Kul hadhi, Kul hadhi sabili ad'u ila Allah. Say, this is my way, I call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadhi sabili, this is my way, I am a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When did, when did Yusuf salam say this? Where was he? Who remembers his story? Beautiful story. So much we can learn from Surah Yusuf. He was inside the prison. Who was he calling to the, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Prison mates. Criminals, prisoners, people that you'd think are the, lo the, the lowest 
that you'd never consider to call to Allah Ta'ala. But Yusuf Alayhi teaches us that every single human being, it is not for us to judge who's worthy of the da'wah. Every single human being has the right to be told of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, has the right to be share, to share this, for you to share this message with them. Do not think this person may understand or may not understand, you know, is at the right level, is not at the right level, that's not for you. Wherever space you find yourself, in whatever situation, you are to make da'wah. His prisoners asked him for advice, and he said, the advice will come, you know, I'm gonna tell you about your dreams, but just let me tell you something more important. Let me tell you about what I worship and what I believe and what I believe in my akhirah. This is the kind of what we can learn, how we make da'wah. So you take, you understand your role as Khalifa, and you learn it from Yusuf also. You learn it first from Muhammad, first from Adam, and Muhammad was our last prophet, and Dawood we mentioned, and now Yusuf salam. Right? And so he called his prison mates and he realized that every single individual. And sometimes we question why our generation, why us here in this room don't really do da'wah? Are we afraid? Do we think that we don't know enough? If you know one thing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you know one thing about the Prophet, share it with others. Right? Make the da'wah. Right? Or it's because we don't think that what we have is that important. That's the scarier part. We have failed to recognize the gem that we have. We have failed to recognize that this religion that we follow, this understanding of the haqq, is what will save humanity here and beyond, in our lands and beyond. We have a gem that others out there are searching for, they're lost, they're in darkness. But we, don't, we, haven't, re we, haven't, we haven't realized this. And that's the scarier part. It's not because we don't have enough ilm, it's because we are not aware of what this da'wah and what this Islam can bring to our neighborhoods and our societies, our communities, right? And so let us make that. And you know, da'wah is not always, I'm going to tell you a story. It's not always by saying and preaching. Sometimes it's by your actions. I heard a story recently about a young man, young professional who just got a new job. And he finds out from his boss, first day, you have a lunch, um, uh, um, you know, you, can, you get $30 a day for your lunch, right? You go out, you know, you have a lunch hour, $30 a day you can spend. Um, and so, you know, the people in the back room, the people who do human resources, they take in, the, the, they collect, you know, they, they pay people. Um, they say that there's somebody new in this, in the, uh, that we just hired. Every day we get a bill, a uh, receipt from him, you know, he punches it online or in his Excel sheet or whatever. He, uh, 1829, 2154, right? All these numbers. Everybody else is $30, $30. So they call this young man in and they say, you know, you have $30 to spend. Everybody else is taking the $30 daily. Why, what is this $15.39 and $17.25 and what? He said, this is my faith. I am a Muslim. I take only what is my right. And they were floored. They were wowed. So we carry ourselves just like Musa, I mean Yusuf, sorry, Yusuf, Remember him when you think about da'wah. He was told four times in his surah, you are from the muhsineen, you are from the muhsineen. Because of the way he carried himself in dignity and understanding of right from wrong, regardless of the environment that he was in. Right, he carried himself with ihsan. That is our da'wah. So two ways you're gonna be a khalifa I mentioned. Da'wah was the second one. Islah, right? What does islah mean? Da'wah is to call others to the faith. Islah is to reform to reform the communities and the spaces and the platforms that you are part of. To call for reform, to advocate, to say this is right and this is wrong, right? And so each one, some of us have the power and have the ability to speak up to those who may be oppressive or tyrants or those who may be not treating others with justice. And we, so we advocate and we do islah and we call for that, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah, our mission, I, I, I serve on the Mass National Team. And our mission in Mass is a vibrant American Muslim community striving for justice and virtue for the whole of society. Justice and virtue is not for our families, our communities, our masajid, our Islamic schools, no. Justice and virtue is for every single human being that Allah created, regardless if they follow our faith or not. We want goodness, we want islah for everybody. We want equality and fairness for everybody, right? And, and that is what we do as Muslims. That is our Khalifa role on earth, our Islah, right? Justice and virtue for all. And so, 
This is actually the ultimate goal of why we strive in this earth, why you study and why you invest in your studies and why you get degrees and why you, you know, take courses and extra education and all of this. Because you understand that, yes, there is benefit in this dunya, but that you understand the greater benefit that, or the greater purpose that you are a Khalifa and that these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you the ability to do, you're going to use it to call others and to reform, right? Because your ultimate purpose and your ultimate destination is where Adam was put in the very beginning, is Jannah. You want to be there in Jannah? You have to realize your responsibility as a Khalifa and you have to focus on that role and get yourself there, right? But we also realize that subhanAllah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes gives us those abilities and those skills. It becomes a test. One minute. It becomes a test, subhanAllah. It becomes a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he will, this test is, is going to be, a, being a khalifa is a test on earth. Make sure that you always define your haq through Allah and you do not follow your hawa. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us. The last thing I'm going to end with is, wa'ad Allahu ladhina aman wa amnu salihat. Allah promises those who believe and do good deeds. He promises us that he will give us authority and that he will give us leadership on earth. As long as we obey him, as long as we worship him. The end of that surah, the, the ayah is a long ayah and I don't have time. He says he will make them, he will give them peace and security after khawf. Because sometimes when you're calling and you're making da'wah, there's some fear. There's those who want to follow their hawa that are attacking you. They don't want to follow the haq. They don't want to give justice to everybody. Right? And so there's fear of making this islah and calling for this da'wah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you trek this terrain, know that Allah promises you that he will give you authority one day, inshallah. Know that Allah promises our religion uh, authority, inshallah, as long as we worship Allah and we do not associate any partners with him. As we said, that is our purpose and that is our destiny. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam sallam kathira. I have a random question for you. How many have heard my poem that I do about countries? Okay, that's little enough that I can do it again. Okay, so whenever I have a, a, a group of people that I'm meeting for the first time and I'm meeting some of you for the first time, and it's a diverse group like this, I like to just hear where everybody's from. So where are y'all from? Masr. Masr. Masr is always first. Who's from Egypt here? Okay, mashallah. What else do we have? Somalia. Who's from Somalia here? Allahu Akbar. Okay, what else do we have? Sudan. Who's from Sudan here? Sudan has some, some sound with it. Palestine. Who's from Palestine? No, no, let me do this again. Who's today? Who's from Palestine? Okay, better. What else do we have? Nigeria. Who's from Nigeria here? In Aquana. Who's from Gambia? Okay, very good. What else? Huh? Bosnia, who's Bosnian here? Okay. Afghanistan, who's from Afghanistan? Habibi, you just said Gambia. No, no, you don't shout out for all of your friends. If your friend doesn't want to raise their own hand, the khalas. What else do we have? Syria, who's from Syria here? Okay, what else do we have? Russia, who's Russian here? Okay, mashallah. What else we got? China, who's Chinese here? It's a bunch of Africans saying China. Where, who's, from, who's from China? What else do we have? So we don't have China, just for the record. What else do we have? Say, Morocco, who's from Morocco in here? Okay, great, we got some Moroccans. Algeria, who's Algerian here? All right, what else? Niger, who's from Niger here? Okay. So if someone is from Niger, what do they call them? Nigerian. So Nigerian. Nigerian. Okay. So not Nigerian, Nigerian. Okay. What else? Who's from Eritrea here? Okay, very good. India, who's Indian here? Okay. Bangladesh, who's from Bangladesh? Okay. Iraq, who's from Iraq here? All right. Yemen, who's from Yemen here? Okay. Why are we clapping for Yemen? 
Anything else? India. What? India? India. Libya. Who's from Libya here? Okay. Yes, sir. Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Who's from Nicaragua here? Honestly, it was just going to be you, bro. But okay. <laughs> Very good. Nicaragua. What else? Lebanon? Lebanon? Who's from Lebanon here? Okay. I think that's everybody, right? You said Iraq? What are you saying? Lebanon? Okay. Anything else? Canada. Who's from Canada here? Okay. Russia, Canada. Yes? Yeah, Canada and Pakistan. Okay, mashallah. Yes? Huh? El Salvador. El Salvador. Who's from El Salvador here? Mashallah, nice. Is that everybody? Where am I from? I'm from Sudan. All day. Yes. Where are you from? Huh? Khartoum? No, we're not doing cities, bro. Like, that was Sudan. Okay. Khartoum. Making us look bad right now. <clears throat> Anything else? America. America. Who's American here? Ohio. Ohio, mashallah. Every, everybody else is working on their paperwork, mashallah. They're not American yet. Make dua. <clears throat> this is going to be hard. This is a lot of countries. So we'll go like this. Sudan is my hometown. Jerusalem is my heart. I flash a Syrian smile. I've been Egyptian from the start. My kindness comes from Pakistan, my style, Senegalese. Yemen and Somalia join two continents at my knees. A Bosnian mind, Libyan legs, Algerian disposition, Moroccan passion, Lubnani fashion, and Bengali disposition, Bengali precision. Wherever Allah is worshiped are my people, I conclude, Nicaraguan, esteem, a Salvadorian cuisine, American attitude. I have history in Nigerian soil and Nigerian sand, a future shining from Khorasan. My present is where I stand. My eyes peer from Kashmir. Is that Pakistan or India? Okay, okay. My eyes peer from Kashmir towards a Russian rising sun. My body's indivisible. I'm an ummah of one. I tried. I tried. I wasn't going to get everybody. Okay. So alhamdulillah, salallahu alayhi wa sallam, rasulillah, when talking about living legacy, there's really just one hadith that I want to speak about for a few minutes. But this hadith is a beautiful hadith, and it's a profound hadith, and it's a hadith that I tell people all the time. If there's... One hadith that I want to have hanging on my wall that I look at every day, it is this hadith. If there's one that I turn into a magnet and I put on my fridge, if there's one that I look at every day as a key to success, it's this hadith. It's three points. I want you to write down the three points. I want you to then turn it into a magnet, put it on your fridge, put it on your wall, share it with other people. It is keys to success. When you're talking about living your legacy, the Prophet ﷺ mentions three points. And in fact, I even have this hadith as the cover of my notebook. Rasulullah ﷺ says in the hadith that's reported by Muslim, it's the hadith of Abu Huraira. He simply says, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Wasta'in billah wa la ta'jas. It is amazing. He says, focus on what benefits you and seek the help of Allah, and don't give up. These three things, keys to success in every field of endeavor. Number one, he says, focus on what benefits you. And the ulama say that the secret of this phrase is that letter kaf, because that kaf means you. What benefits me is different than what benefits you. And what benefits you is different than what benefits your sister. What benefits you is different than what benefits your brother. What benefits you is different than what benefits the community. I remember Sheikh Saadi, rahimahullah, I was reading his debate, talking about occupations. People ask the question, young people ask, what career should I go into? And he mentions the scholarly debate about what is better, to be a merchant or to be a farmer. 
Because merchants have incredible reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who's an entrepreneur relies upon Allah at a way that is different than a person who is an employee. You start to become dependent on your paycheck. But a person who every day is going out into the market, you know, it's, it's commonplace in many Muslim countries, store owners, that they begin their day by saying, Ya Fattah, Ya Alim. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up the doors of risk for them. You never know where your risk is coming from. You're seeking it out. Your heart is attached to Allah. And then you're looking at the farmer. And the farmer is waiting on rain. And you have these prayers for rain that every agricultural society has. Atheism doesn't grow on farms. It grows in cities where they don't know where their watermelons come from. They think it comes from the local grocery store. The farmer is very attuned to nature and they're very attuned to the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who brings them rain. And if that rain does not come, the vegetation doesn't grow. So which one is better? And so Sheikh Saadi says the answer to that is in this hadith. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uka. Focus on what benefits you. For some people, going out and buying and selling and trade, that is what's better for them. And for some, agriculture is better. Your career path, it's all about where you benefit. And even when it comes to Islamic work, where do you find your spirituality? There are some people, truly, they find their spirituality in sitting in classes like this and learning and taking notes and memorizing and reading Quran. And there are some people, don't we all know people, who that is not where they find their spirituality. They would much rather go out and volunteer in the streets and feed the homeless and take care of, of people. That is where they find their iman. And one is not better than the other. Everyone is supposed to go and find what benefits them. So what is your superpower? Every single one of us has a unique combination of talents and gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. When I first started speaking, a brother of mine, a good friend of mine, he sat down with me and he said, Ahmad, what's your superpower? I said, what do you mean? I have zero superpowers. He said, no, I mean, what's your unique talents that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you? Because if I tried to be like a academic, I'm not an academic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make me like that. So if I tried to sound like an academic and act like an academic, it wouldn't have worked for me. And if I tried to be like this incredibly emotional sheikh, who, that's not me. I can't be that person, but I am a poet, and that's, that's how Allah made me. And I do like to study Islam, that's how Allah made me. And so I have my merging of lanes, and every single one of us has that combination. But you can't be somebody that you're not, you can only be who you are and focus on what benefits you. Find your superpower. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, and seek the help of Allah. You know, all of these self-help books, they'll tell you to focus on what benefits you, and they'll tell you how to goal set. But they won't tell you the second ingredient that the Prophet ﷺ says, and that is to seek the help of Allah. No matter how big your aspirations are, no matter how big your goals are, if Allah doesn't say yes, it will always be a no. Rasulullah ﷺ says, seek the help of Allah. While you are going out and seeking that degree, also seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if Allah says yes, then you're going to get that degree. If Allah says yes, that project is going to be successful. If Allah says yes, that business is going to be successful. Make sure that you are asking Allah even more than you're asking people for assistance because He is the one who has the keys. Ibn al-Qayyim says something very, very profound and very beautiful. In Adda'wa da'wa he says that if you find yourself raising your hands to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that moment, you should be happy because Allah did not inspire you to ask except because he wanted to give you. How many people do you know are broke? And they talk to everybody about being broke. The only one who they don't ask, they don't ask to, to, to enrich them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many people are single, they're looking to get married and they talk to this imam and that imam and this person and that person and they're swiping left and swiping right and swiping up and swiping down. And they're not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them rizq. Ibn al-Qayyim says, if you find yourself making dua, then in that moment you should be happy because Allah did not inspire you to ask except because he wanted to give you. Allah says, Ujibu I respond to the call of the caller when they call upon me. And then number three, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Wala ta'jaz, don't give up. I figured out what my goal is. I'm asking Allah, I'm begging Allah, I'm going after it, then don't give up. And if you were to look at everybody who is successful, everybody, 
you will find that they are different in their talents, they're different in their resources, they're different in everything. The one common factor that they have is that they were persistent. Four businesses failed, their fifth one was successful. They were persistent. Will Smith has a story, I don't know if we're allowed to mention Will Smith at an Islamic conference, but Will Smith has a story where he was 12 years old and his dad had him and his brother build a wall. And he said, this is one of the most important lessons I learned in my life, that every day in that summer, his dad would have them go out and he said, you don't build a wall by building a wall, but you just work on placing a brick as beautifully as a brick can be placed every day. And you keep doing that every day until you build a wall. LeBron James, I watched this interview of uh, Kevin Love, one of the most, LeBron James is one of the most talented basketball players of all time. And Kevin Love is, is being asked, what is the most unique quality that LeBron has? Guess what he said? His ability to do it all again tomorrow. That's persistence. Always, always showing up. In every field, every field of human endeavor, you will find the common quality to be persistence. There is a child psychologist, his name is Dr. Leonard Sachs, written a lot of books. I remember one time he gave a lecture to our Muslim community in Houston. This was during COVID. And he said, we researched what makes people successful and we found that the most important quality that they developed was their discipline by the age of 12. That you're able to divide a long goal into daily tasks that you're able to do until you get to that goal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no one has been given anything more comprehensive or better than sabr. What is sabr? We translate sabr as patience, but sabr is way bigger than patience. Sabr is discipline and dedication and resilience and perseverance and grit. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that if you want to achieve any goal that you have in your life, these are three things. Focus on what benefits you, seek the help of Allah, and number three, don't give up, persevere until you get to where you're going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ Sabr is la ta'jaz, it's don't give up, it's persevere, it's endure, it's be resilient. And salah is you turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِصْبِرُوا وَصَابِرُوا وَرَابِتُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Allah says, O oh, you who believe, endure, have patience, hold fast. These three qualities are all about don't giving up, don't, not giving up. And then he says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ Have taqwa of Allah, turn to Allah. So, final thing I want you to walk away with, simply this. Focus, pray, persist. Focus, pray, Persist. Say it with me. Focus. Pray. Persist. So I get this question a lot. When do I stop seeking something? And if I can tell you what the majority of these questions are, are regarding. They're regarding, most of the time, they're about marriage and children. So I'm seeking marriage or I'm seeking children, and both times they're being delayed for whatever reason. When do I know to give up on this? And the answer to that is that you give up when you no longer want it. When you, don't long, when you no longer want it, that is when you give up on a task. Otherwise, as long as you still want marriage, as long as you still want children, then you continue to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it because number one, you don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to write it for you. I just had a friend of mine was telling me of a couple who had their first child at 49 years old. Both of them were 49 years old and that's not, that's not uh, any too big for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then number two, if in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree, it truly isn't written for you, then the du'as that you are making in pain are higher quality worship than a du'a that you make not in pain. And what I mean by that is the du'a that you make when you really, really want something. If I spend a lifetime asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something that I really want, and I meet him on the day of judgment with all of those broken du'as, these might be the greatest acts of worship that I offer. Instead of me muting that pain just so that I could ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something easier. I hope that makes sense. We also have to sometimes think about 
Sometimes we're, we're asking for something that we really, really want, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us something bigger and better. So part of this asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you know, Allah, this is what I think is best for me. That's why I really want it. But if there's something in your plan that you think is better, please put that, let that fill my eyes. Let that fill my heart. Let me accept that thing, right? Because I had a friend who, who had wanted to go to medical school actually and applied over and over and over. And, and then she realized that, you know, she found another path and she loves it now. But she had to accept the fact and say to Allah Taala, if this is not really meant for me, so show me what is and make me pleased with it and make that, 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 that path of that other thing flow like water. So I find it, I enjoy it, I, I, I love it, and I realize this is actually better than what I was asking for. So always keep that window with Allah Taala because what you think is best for you may not necessarily be the thing that's written for you now and is best for you now. I'm going to try to combine these two, or these three rather. Some people want to know how to increase in their knowledge of the deen, and particularly how to stay persistent in them. And a third question that can kind of maybe relate on the topic of persistence is how can you build discipline if everything you do is about procrastination? Everything you do is what? By procrastination. So, I'll just briefly answer. Uh, I think the first question was, how can I learn the deen? So it depends on where you are, obviously, in the world, if you're in a major city, if you're not. But I would encourage people, of course, uh, faithessentials.online is a great platform that we built at Al-Maghrib, faithessentials.online, where you can get access to 32 short courses on Islamic topics. We basically looked at what everything a Muslim needs to know, from aqidah to fiqh, basic fiqh, basic tafsir, without all of the details and the scholarly discussions. And so you can get a good grasp that way with Faith Essentials. Then number two is how do I, the second question was about um, persistent. persistence. So, you know, there's a beautiful African proverb, which is if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, then go together. And so the idea of doing something as a community, doing something as friends, doing something, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى finding a, 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 a collective of, of people who you can seek knowledge with, inshallah ta'ala, is very, very helpful because when you start to become uh, tired, they lift you and they carry you and they move you forward, the idea of a bubble. And then the third thing was, um, what was the third thing? Uh, how, to stay persistent how to stay persistent? I think it's the same thing, which is having people who hold you accountable until you're able to develop a habit. You know, you aim for 30 days, and then inshallah ta'ala, after 30 days, it becomes much more easy to sustain a habit. So you want to make sure that you create the habit over 30 days, and that just becomes a matter of you really, really, really seeking a way to hold yourself accountable. You get the scariest person in your community to hold you accountable for this task, whoever it is that you're terrified of. Or you, 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 do, you, you dedicate some money if you fail. Like, you figure out what is your trigger, and then you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. To add to that, subhanAllah, um, and Maghrib courses are amazing. We've had uh, Maghrib, you know, um, just like we have Brother Amar Shukri here, they've come to different, our different mass centers across the country and delivered courses and specific things. So it's important that you guys go and reach out that knowledge and even sometimes find it online, go through it. But I also want to stress the idea that there has to be somebody that's learning with you. Somebody that's not just a teacher, but a mentor. You need to go into your spaces where you're growing up, into your community centers, your youth centers, your masajid, and find somebody that can help you decipher this knowledge. When you have a question, they're gonna kind of have to answer it. When you wanna understand, Tab, I just learned this new hadith or this new ayah, how do I apply it to me? How does it change my habits? How does it make me a better person? That, that mentor, that teacher that's taking this journey with you is gonna tell you, let's put together a plan for you. Let's find out how you're gonna apply this ayah. Just like at the Sahaba that Umar would learn, learn five ayat and go home and think about it and, and reflect on it and apply it and go back and learn some more. So you need to find that person that's gonna take you on this journey of learning, keep you on it and make sure that you're translating the knowledge to make you a better Khalifa basically.